It offers a new interpretation of Paul's writings. Crossan describes Paul as the most dominant figure after Jesus in the New Testament. Thirteen of its 27 books are attributed to Paul, and about half of another is about him. Why did you want to re-examine Paul? Because Paul has got a really bad press. It's, it's a major question whether he is, as we, one of our chapters says, an appealing or an appalling apostle. And the reason is this, that there really are three different Pauls in the New Testament. A conservative Paul, a liberal Paul, and a radical Paul. And it depends upon whether a given letter was really originally, authentically written by Paul or was attributed to him later. That's the issue, really. When you say that Paul has gotten a, a bad rep, um, I think one of the things you're probably talking about is uh, what he said about women. Why don't you um, uh, quote some, you know, one or two of his most famous passages about <laughs> Infamous. the submissive role of women? Let me use the, the, gender, the gender controversy as a way of discriminating the three Pauls. The conservative Paul is usually what everyone knows from First Timothy, where he says that women are to be at home, and they're not supposed to be teaching men in church, which, by the way, tells us, of course, that they were. You wouldn't have to forbid something that wasn't happening. But in First Timothy, women are not to be teaching men in church. They're to be at home. They're to be pregnant. They're to be silent. If they have questions, ask their husband. Nice and clear. That's the conservative Paul in First Timothy, which was not written by Paul. The liberal Paul would appear, say, in Ephesians and Colossians, also not written by Paul, where he says that uh, women should obey their husbands, but then spends a lot more time telling husbands that they should sacrifice themselves for their wives, something that tends to get forgotten. I call that the liberal Paul. The radical Paul, the radical Paul is the one, say, in Corinthians or in Romans, who insists that women are equal to men in the family, in the community, that's the church, in the apostolate. The Paul, for example, who sends the epistle to the Romans, his most important epistle, with a woman. And, of course, she's going to have to then read the epistle, explain the epistle to the communities at Rome. This is the radical Paul who simply says that in Christ Jesus there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, in Christ Jesus. Well, your, your new book, In Search of Paul, is co-written with an archaeologist. And uh, are there, is there like archaeological information that helps you determine which of these three Pauls you think is the more authentic? What we are really doing in archaeology is looking for the archaeology of Paul's theological world, not just his social world, but, for example, all over the Roman Empire, in archaeological digs that you can find, you can't miss them, in coins, in inscriptions, in images, in structures, you're getting a message that Caesar is divine, son of God, God, God from God, Lord, Savior of the world, Redeemer, Liberator, all of that stuff is there. So when Paul walks into Ephesus, for example, he walks under a gate that says that the imperator Caesar is the son of God. Now, when he talks to his people in Ephesus about Jesus being the Son of God, that is known technically as high treason. So it's precisely the archaeology of Roman imperial theology that makes so much importance for Paul, rather than, well, we know he was in Ephesus, here's what Ephesus looked like in the first century. Let me quote something from your new book about Paul. You write, What is newest about this book is our insistence that Paul opposed Rome not because the empire was particularly unjust or oppressive, but because he questioned the normalcy of civilization itself, since civilization has always been imperial, that is, unjust and oppressive. Could you, could you explain that? Yes, it's an invention. Civilization is an invention, and it has always been imperial. From the first time the Akkadians went... <laughs> roaring down the Mesopotamian plains, and isn't it ironic? You know, it starts on the Mesopotamian plains, where we are today. Empire has been the normalcy of civilization. We tend to think that well, civilization is about music and art and literature and all that magnificent stuff, which it is, of course, very often on the back, of course, of an empire, sometimes at its most fruitful times. So if civilization has always been imperial, then Paul is not against Rome because he wants, say, a Jewish empire or a, an Irish empire, maybe. It's because there's something wrong with civilization, not with human nature, but with civilization. It always goes imperial, which means unjust. And he is, his language, say, of a new creation, 
I don't find even, you know, hyperbolic. It's like we're going to have to go back and start all over again because our, using my metaphor, our drug of choice in civilization has been violence. And we're now getting to the point where the withdrawal or the continuation are about equally awful. So Paul is really challenging civilization on its basis. Why is it always imperial, he wants to know. What did Paul do, do that w was most challenging of the Roman Empire? What Paul is doing is really setting up, I would almost say, an alternative empire, because he is not just sitting down in one place. He's moving around the whole Mediterranean, and what he is doing is setting up small little cells, as it were, in the major cities. If you watch what he does, he goes straight for the capitals. Mm -hmm. He's in... Thessalonica, capital of Macedonia. He's in Corinth, capital of Achaia. He's in Ephesus, capital of Asia. And he grows up in Tarsus, capital of Cilicia. He, he's a man of capitals. And his strategy is to go to the capital, set up your little cells of an alternative lifestyle. They'll go out to the other cities, and maybe they'll get to the countryside eventually. And his method of doing it is setting up these tiny Christian, he calls them assemblies. We, we translate them as churches, which throws us off. They're really... The Greek word is ecclesia, which is the word for the at least male members of the city when they come together to decide the city's destiny and fate. And I imagine him in, in the shops. I think that's where he would meet, not in the villas or not in the houses or the, the tenements, but in those shops you can still see all over Roman cities. There are maybe 10 feet by 10 feet. And people coming in and out, not going to draw any attention to themselves. Small little groups, 10 15, we're not talking huge, but there might be three, four, five in any given city. There's certainly six or seven in Rome alone, but they're all over the place. It's not, it's not so much whether they are a thousand Christians by the year 50, but whether there's 10 in a hundred cities. Paul believed that the end of days was near and that the second coming would happen in his lifetime. Um, how did that have affect his view of the Roman Empire and what should be done about it, and his view uh, of what, what the righteous life was. And by the way, thank you, Terry, for saying the end of days, because sometimes what people say is the end of the world. And in the first century, Jews and Christians never imagined the end of the world because only God could destroy creation. And God would never do that since God had created it and said it was all good. We can imagine the end of the world because we can do it, unfortunately. So what Paul is claiming, like Jesus before him, is that this great period of what he calls justification, uh, meaning making the world a just place. It's a very simple, everyday word. It sounds strange to us, but justification. Augustus would probably say, oh, that's what I'm doing. Yep, I'm making the world just. So Paul talks about justification. And what he is declaring is that the end of days when God would make the world just has already commenced. Now, you're also quite right in saying that he tells them, don't worry, it'll be over soon. Because any radical mutation in thinking, we always want to say, well, it's not that great a radical. It's just a, a minor thing. Now, he was wrong on that. And my advice is simply get over it. The more important thing, though, is he was insisting that it has begun and God is calling us to participate with God in the process, rather than us waiting for God, as it were. It's a, it's a dialectical process between God and us. Nobody's waiting on the other. This has to be done together, not us without God, not God without us. Otherwise, it would be impossible to explain why Christianity didn't dribble out after about two generations in acute disappointment. But he was simply wrong about the minor point. Now, if you want to say, well, the second coming is still off in the future, and when he said soon, that means today, well, good luck. I would simply say, Anyone who has talked about the future, with, let me speak within Christianity, has been wrong. It might be time to begin to wonder, is our assertion about the second coming our refusal to accept the first one? And is this idea of a non-violent Jesus just something we can't handle? So we want Jesus to come back and do it right. Come back and get it right. Come back violently in plain language. So the real question about the second coming is do we or do we not believe in a violent God and did Jesus and Paul proclaim or did they not proclaim a violent God? Now, I should say listeners 
having who are listening to us might be thinking, have they changed format? <laughs> Is this a religious show now? Because we're talking, I mean, we're literally talking chapter and verse here. Right. Um, and um, so I'm I'm wondering for anybody who isn't Christian who's listening and who isn't um, interested in studying Paul uh, be, be, because it tells them more about their religion, what uh, historical significance does your book about Paul have and what or what relevance does it have for people today who are not necessarily um, uh, followers of Christianity? Well, we've just gone through an election in which the conservative right in this country assumed a monopoly on Christianity, on moral values, on biblical traditions, and probably at least indirectly on Jesus and Paul. What this book does, as the earlier book Excavating Jesus does, is insist that there is another vision of Christianity and of the Bible and of moral values which is equally Christian. For example, I can talk about Jesus and Paul, or I can talk using Christian language and all the rest of it. I could use Paul's Greek term, dikaiosune, justification and righteousness, or I could translate that into global justice, which is what it is, by the way. I'm not just, you know, flipping it. Paul is asking, how is this world, the world, he would say God's world, but let me say the world, to be maintained justly, and justly simply means that everyone gets a fair shake at it. That is public language. It actually is the language, since I am in Philadelphia, of all people being created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's not what Paul is saying, but that's the way we said it. So this is actually transcendental language. You make a claim that all, let me say all people, are created equal. That's an imperial claim almost. It's a transcendental claim. It is, in plain language, a theological claim. And if the T word, theology, is a dirty word for some people, then they better at least learn how to oppose it with public discourse language. I want to get back to the fact that uh, Paul believed that he would witness the second coming of Christ in his own lifetime, and um, that the end of days was near. Um, many Christians believe that today, that the uh, second coming is imminent, they will witness the end of days, and there's a vision of the end of days that says that um, those who have been born again will rise to heaven, and everybody else will be left behind on earth to face the tribulations. Um, and this is a vision that is, among other things, described in a very popular series of novels called the Left Behind series that's co-authored by Tim LaHaye, who was one of the founders of the Moral Majority and who is one of the leaders of the new group that was just founded by Gerald, Jerry Falwell, which is okay. uh, a, kind of like a new vision of the, of the Moral Majority. So for, for how, is there a way, do you think that today's vision of the Second Coming is affecting either uh, culture in America or politics in America? Yes, I do. I think it's a infecting it, <laughs> not just affecting it, but it's infecting it with a sort of a culture of violence, first of all, because it says, in effect, that God's final solution to the problem of evil is to kill the evildoer, rather massively. The rider on the white horse in the apocalypse is going to have blood up to the bridles for 200 miles, which is a pretty ghastly scenario. And I think it does infect us in general, but it also infects us in particular that when it was communism against capitalism, as it were, and both had the atomic bombs, and uh, they held one at bay because we sort of could trust that nobody would do anything really stupid. If I imagine religious fundamentalism of any sort, but we're talking for the moment about Christian fundamentalism, which has atomic power. I don't mean it's going to go out and destroy the world someday, but it could do this, which leads to that, which leads to this, which leads to that, and at that point we have no alternative, let's say, but use the atomic bomb. It could have a certain carelessness about the faith of the world, since it presumes that it and people like it are going off to heaven, to a better place, and that maybe God is consigning the world to hell, as it were. 